welcome. I know there will be people joining us late as people tend to do during the lunch hour, um, and but hopefully they won't miss the good part, the speaker. Um, so welcome, my name is Lee Frame. Um, I'm the Director of Integrative Medicine here at GW, as well as the Associate Director of the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. Um, and I also have a PhD in nutrition, so I'm pretty excited about this talk. This is like right up my alley, so hopefully you guys will be as excited as I am. Um, so welcome, this is the second seminar in this academic year's GW Biomedical Cross Disciplinary Seminar Series, the goal of which is to promote networking and collaboration in translational health among researchers, healthcare providers, and policymakers from different disciplines to shift the paradigm, from seeking a cure to developing a strategy of prevention. This year, the GW Office of Integrative Medicine and Health has partnered with the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center and the Department of Medicine on the theme of preventative cardiology. To see the full lineup, visit our website, which Janet will put in the chat, or just search for GW Biomedical Cross Disciplinary Seminar Series. Today, we'll hear from Dr. Christina Peterson on translating nutrition science into practice. Dr. Christina Peterson has a Bachelor of Nutrition and Dietetics with honors from Flinders University in Australia and a PhD in Nutrition from the University of South Australia. She completed postdoctoral training in public health and epidemiology at Australia's the George Institute for Global Health and then in clinical nutrition at the Pennsylvania State University here in the U.S. Dr. Peterson was an assistant research professor at Penn State University from 2018 to 2020. And then she joined the Department of Nutritional Sciences at Texas Tech University as an assistant professor in the fall of 2020, which is where she is right now. Uh, Dr. Peterson's research focuses on nutritional strategies to delay and prevent the onset of cardiometabolic diseases. She studies the efficacy and effectiveness of dietary interventions to reduce metabolic dysfunction and the risk of cardiometabolic diseases in at-risk populations. Dr. Peterson conducts human clinical trials to examine the effect of individual foods bioactives, and dietary patterns on risk factors for cardiometabolic <laughs> cardio diseases. In addition, she aims to translate research findings gained under highly controlled conditions to strategies that improve the overall diet of free-living individuals, strategies which are underpinned by behavior change theory. So with that, a warm welcome as I turn it over to you, Christina. Okay, thank you, Lee, for, for that nice introduction and also for the invitation uh, to speak at this seminar series. So I'm very happy to be able to join you all virtually uh, this afternoon to talk uh, generally about how we translate nutrition science into practice. However, um, the principles that we will be talking about uh, will translate to other fields. Um, obviously, my area is nutritional sciences, so that's what we'll be talking about. However, when we're thinking about physical activity or other lifestyle uh, related uh, behaviors, these uh, same principles will apply. Um, so in terms of our overview, uh, we're gonna start uh, out general. Uh, we're gonna talk about the contribution of dietary risks to cardiovascular disease burden. Um, and then we're gonna talk about um, some of the ways that we can alleviate uh, this uh, burden of dietary risks on uh, cardiovascular outcomes by turning to some of our evidence-based guidelines. So we're gonna talk about three uh, key guidelines in this area. And really what I'm hoping to highlight here is how we take our science, so the research that we do, how this is then used to formulate guidelines and then how we can use those guidelines uh, in our practice, right? And here I'm using the term practice very broadly. So um, it can be policy, uh, it can be uh, community related uh, programs, but also uh, clinical practice. Um, and so we'll finish out really talking about how we do translate all of this science into our everyday practice and thinking about the kinds of considerations that are important here. So being aware of what current intake patterns are within the population, but also I think importantly, which is often kind of missed as part of this conversation, is what drives and motivates uh, diet behaviors. So uh, diet is more complicated than just the foods that we eat. There is a lot that goes into what we uh, eat every day. So we need to be aware of the kinds of things that motivate or drive people to make the choices that they uh, choose. And then finishing out with how we manage dietary risks within uh, clinical settings. So when we talk about dietary uh, risk factors, we have a lot of data that suggests that they are a key contributor 
to modifiable risk for cardiovascular disease. So this is data from the Global Burden of Disease study uh, from 1990 and then also uh, 2019. And what we see here is dietary risks are the leading behavioral risk, um, but they are the number two risk overall. Um, so a key proportion of cardiovascular events, disease, and death are attributable to uh, dietary risk factors. And then arguably, when we look at some of these metabolic risk factors here, um, you know, diet influences these things. So we know, for example, uh, diet is strongly linked to blood pressure, to LDL cholesterol, to BMI, and so forth. When we look specifically at what these dietary risk factors are, this chart shows you um, the risk attributable uh, to different dietary uh, factors. So uh, a key takeaway here is the vast uh, uh, majority of uh, dietary uh, risks contribute to cardiovascular diseases. So we see cardiovascular disease in the dark red here. Um, and some proportion of deaths from type 2 diabetes and cancer are also attributable to dietary risk factors. Something important to note about this list here is the vast majority of these dietary risks are things that we don't eat enough of versus things that we eat too much of. So we see at the top here a diet high in sodium accounts for a large proportion of CVD deaths. Uh, down the list here, we see uh, diets high in trans fats, uh, also processed meats and high in uh, red meats overall are associated with CBD uh, risk. However, all of these other things are things that we don't eat enough of. So I think oftentimes when we're talking about dietary risks, we make the assumption that it's overconsumption of foods. However, when we look at this kind of data, it really tells us that it's um, under consumption of a broad range of foods that are driving uh, cardiovascular disease uh, deaths. And when we put all of this together, we see that uh, globally about 20% of deaths are attributable to dietary risk factors. So this really highlights the opportunities for um, strategies that uh, improve dietary risk factors and the potential that they would have to reduce uh, diet-related chronic diseases, of which cardiovascular disease uh, is a key one. So then turning to some of the evidence-based guidelines, which could inform our approaches to how we're going to shift uh, individuals or populations towards uh, having less dietary risk factors or having uh, better diet quality overall. So firstly, I want to talk about the dietary guidelines for Americans, the 2020 to 2025 iteration. So uh, something important to note about the dietary guidelines for Americans is that um, the first guidelines were introduced in 1980. And by law, it is mandated that they are updated every five years. Um, so we will have new guidelines in uh, 2025. Um, why this is important is because these guidelines do a good job of keeping up with science as science evolves. So because they need to be updated every five years, they can be much more current than some of our clinical practice guidelines, which are not mandated uh, to be updated at any given uh, frequency. Um, so when we uh, talk about the dietary guidelines, it's important to keep in mind what the purpose is. So um, what these are, are evidence-based recommendations for all Americans. So this includes those who are healthy, those who are at risk of diet-related diseases, or those who are living with diseases. Um, and the goal really is to meet nutrient needs, promote health, and prevent disease. Um, and so here, as the health status of the U.S. population changes, but also the makeup of the U.S. population, these guidelines need to evolve to address the needs of, of everyone within the population. And so um, I'll take you for a quick kind of uh, tour through all the dietary guidelines in a moment, because I think there's some interesting uh, points there. Um, but something to keep in mind that as the U.S. population uh, becomes less healthy, so as we have a greater burden of diet-related diseases, so things like uh, overweight and obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, these kinds of conditions, these guidelines need to evolve to be appropriate for, for those individuals. So while the guidelines started out as being mostly targeted to healthy populations, they've really had to shift the focus given the health status of the population overall. 
We also have our 2021 AHA, uh, so American Heart Association Dietary Guidance to Improve Cardiovascular Health. So this is a summary of evidence that documents aspects of diet that improves cardiovascular health uh, and reduces uh, risk overall. And then we have our 2019 American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guideline on the primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And so these are evidence-based recommendations for the primary prevention of CVD in adults. So as we go through these guidelines today, um, I want to uh, kind of underscore the, the contribution of science here. So for the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, they have these uh, recommendation systems that they use to classify the uh, class of recommendations um, and then also the level of evidence. So this is essentially how they uh, weigh up all of the different uh, kinds of evidence or the science that they have and how they use this to formulate the different guidelines that are made. So this is the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association system. So this is what is used in uh, any of the guidelines from those societies. However, this framework has also been used by other organizations. So for example, the National Lipid Association uses this. So when we're talking about class or strength of recommendation, here what we're essentially talking about is the risk benefit analysis. So where you see a class one or strong uh, recommendation, this is where the benefits strongly outweighs uh, any uh, risk. So this means the treatment or intervention uh, is useful and effective and should be performed in most patients under most circumstances. When we have a 2A recommendation, um, here we still have the benefit outweighing the risk just to a lesser proportion. And for a 2B recommendation, here we have the benefit being equal to or uh, greater than the risk. Um, and so here, um, implementation may be more selective and may be based on uh, uh, an individual uh, individualized approach. For a class three, this is where there's no benefit. Um, so the benefit is equal to the risk. Um, and then for a class three recommendations, this is where the risk outweighs the benefit. So there's, uh, there's harm here. When we're talking about the level of evidence, this um, directly weight, uh, is weighted by the quality of the evidence. So the quality of the science that is used um, and important to note here, this is um, mostly coming from a, a medical perspective. So where we, when we are doing uh, trials or assessing if, uh, efficacy or effectiveness for uh, pharmacological agents or devices, that kind of thing, uh, we do need randomized control trials. So when we talk about nutrition evidence, often we don't have you know, high quality evidence from more than one randomized control trial because it can be very challenging to meet uh, high quality evidence uh, guidelines for randomized control trials for dietary exposures because it's more complicated than just giving a pill uh, and following people for, for many years. Um, but in terms of how this, uh, this classification works, so when you have level A evidence, this is where we have high quality evidence from more than one randomized control trial. And there is a system for evaluating the quality of evidence, so looking at uh, the risk of bias in these studies. Um, this could also be given if there is a meta-analysis of high-quality randomized control trials, or if there is um, one or more randomized control trials that are corro uh, corroborated by high-quality registry studies. Um, for level B, we have uh, two levels. So level BR is for randomized studies. So this is where we have mo uh, moderate quality evidence from more than uh, one or more randomized control trials or a meta-analysis of such studies. For level B and R, um, this is where we have non-randomized studies. So we have moderate evidence from one or more well-designed, well-executed non-randomized studies. We may have observational studies here or registry studies or meta-analyses of such studies. For level C, this is re really where we have limited data. Um, so we have, uh, in the case of LD, it's limited data from randomized or non-randomized observational studies. Uh, these studies may have limitations. We may have uh, meta-analyses of these studies, or this is where um, what we may call basic science or uh, physiological and mechanistic studies fits in. Um, and then for level CE, this is essentially expert opinion. So there's limited evidence here 
um, and the assessment is made based on uh, clinical experience. So just to, just to kind of summarize this, when we're talking about evidence-based guidelines, we're talking about recommendations that are based on systematic methods to evaluate and classify all of the available evidence on a particular uh, topic. Um, so in the case um, of cardiovascular disease, we're talking about using all the different kinds of uh, research that we can do. We're distilling that down into key recommendations for prevention, treatment, and management of risk factors or cardiovascular disease itself. And then we use that to uh, inform our uh, practice. And so, um, the mo as I mentioned before, the three most applicable uh, guidelines are, um, are listed on the screen. And we're just gonna briefly talk through those and how those were, were formulated. So I wanna start out with, with the dietary guidelines. Um, because I think this provides us with a nice example of how when science evolves, and here it's science related to what we know about um, dietary exposure and risk of disease, but also what we know about um, uh, behavior change and also communication uh, about diet-related uh, messaging and how that um, influences individuals. So the overarching recommendation of the dietary guidelines uh, from 2020 to 2025 is that healthy dietary patterns can help people achieve and maintain good health and reduce the risk of chronic diseases throughout all life stages. So here you see the focus is on healthy dietary patterns. This is a relatively recent evolution in terms of the dietary guidelines. So I just want to take a moment to kind of go back through history just to make a couple of key points about uh, nutrition science and how it's changed over time. So here on this screen, I have um, our dietary recommendations from 1980. So this was the first ever dietary guidelines for Americans. And you see here, it's seven relatively straightforward, simple messages. Um, however, also important to note here is that there's a lot of focus on nutrients. So you see point three here is to avoid too much fat, saturated fat and cholesterol. Point four is about eating foods with adequate starch and fiber. Five is around avoiding too much sugar. Six is avoiding too much sodium. And then seven is around alcohol. So a lot of focus on, uh, on nutrient uh, based recommendations. We see the same thing in 1985. Uh, we see minor wording changes with regard to the weight recommendation. Um, but as we move to 1990, we start to see some changes in the language used. So um, the two previous iterations had really focused on words like avoid. Um, and we know this kind of negative uh, language doesn't resonate well with the public. So often there's this perception about when you're following a healthy diet, you need to deprive yourself of things. And when we use language like avoid, that plays into, into those issues. So um, in 1990, they changed up the language to focus more around positive messaging. So you see here for item three, it's related to choose a diet low in fat, saturated fat and cholesterol. So it's not saying to avoid these things, it's saying to pick diets which are low in these things. Um, we also start to see uh, some emphasis on uh, more food focused recommendations. So things like choose a diet with plenty of vegetables, fruits and grain products. Um, but overall, this period of time can really be focused as one uh, where we have nutrient focused recommendations. And this was also a time when um, we had limits on total fat intake. So um, some people may recognize this as the low fat era, uh, where both total fat and saturated fat was limited. And so really, these nutrient focused recommendations came about because that was the kind of evidence that we had at the time. So there was a lot of research linking, for example, saturated fat to LDL or blood cholesterol levels. There was a lot of evidence uh, linking uh, sodium to hypertension. So um, this is a direct reflection of the kind of evidence that we had at the time. As we move through the 90s, um, we start to see more food focused recommendations and recommendations around choosing different kinds of foods and food groups. This was the, pyramid, the, the time where we used the food pyramid to translate the dietary guidelines to the public. So this was kind of the public facing version of the dietary guidelines. 
Um, and so the way that you read these pyramids is that you eat more of the foods at the bottom of the pyramid and less of the foods at the top of the pyramid. So because this was a low fat uh, period, we see a lot of uh, carbohydrate containing foods towards the bottom, as well as fruits and vegetables, and then consuming less um, of animal products, fats, oils, and sweets. Um, so here, this period is focused more on food focused recommendations. So this evolution really took place in recognition of the fact that individuals um, don't eat food, uh, don't eat nutrients, sorry, in, in the sense that uh, for the average person, it's very difficult to determine what the nutrient composition of a given food is, and then also calculate what their intake is of a given nutrient across a day. So for example, for sodium, you know, you have to determine, okay, how much sodium is in this food, and then add up all the different foods that contain sodium for your whole day to know if you're over consuming sodium. So it becomes challenging. So here the shift was really towards food focused recommendations to help the average person know how much of a given food group they had to consume to achieve uh, health. As we move through the 2000s into the current day, we've really seen an evolution uh, to focus more on dietary patterns. Um, and so this is uh, the reasons for this is, is basically twofold. So the first is that evidence, uh, we now have evidence that really suggests that it's the totality of dietary exposures that associate with long-term uh, health outcomes and disease risk. So it's no one food or one nutrient that is going to explain whether or not um, you remain healthy or you get a particular disease. Um, the second piece is around behavior. So uh, individuals eat diets, they don't eat uh, individual foods or individual uh, nutrients. And when we look at things in isolation, there's always the potential for unintended uh, consequences. So, for example, when we had the, the low fat era, the unintended consequence of that was that intake of refined carbohydrates uh, dramatically increased. So people reduced their fat intake, but they ate a lot more refined uh, carbohydrates. Um, and uh, that ne didn't necessarily uh, benefit their health. So when we have dietary pattern-based approaches, we're focusing on the totality of the diet and providing a framework around what is a healthy diet um, for, for health and then a reduction of a chronic disease risk. And so we've really evolved um, to these dietary pattern-focused uh, focused recommendations. And we see that really across the board. So um, here are the examples from the prevention guidelines and the American Heart Association dietary guidance, where they emphasize um, the importance of the, the whole dietary uh, pattern. So I've been using this, this term a lot, but I wanna provide you with, with a definition just so you can kind of see the depth and breadth of this definition and what we're talking about when we use the term dietary pattern. So um, the definition is the quantities, proportions, variety, or combination of different foods, drinks, and nutrients in diets, and the frequency at which they are habitually consumed. So you can see it's an all-encompassing definition um, with an emphasis on what is habitually consumed. So, you know, we know from epidemiological evidence that diet has a long latency uh, period. So it is dietary exposure over a long period of time, which uh, influences our disease risk. Um, and so uh, we need to be focused on, on kind of the long game, if you like, and what is our exposure over time versus what we eat kind of on a, on a daily basis. Um, of in tandem with that is this definition of diet quality. So when we talk about diet quality, this is the assessment of the overall healthfulness of a dietary pattern based on its uh, constituents. So essentially, it's how we assess whether or not somebody is following a healthy dietary pattern. And when we talk about high diet quality, we're talking about dietary patterns that consist of the most nutrient dense forms of foods and beverages that have limited amounts of added sugar, sodium and saturated fat. And so this shift has really uh, occurred um, both in terms of an evolution of the science, but also uh, a better understanding of eating behavior um, and messaging that will influence eating behavior and be helpful for the average uh, person. 
Um, and so uh, we also now recognize the importance of eating a healthy dietary pattern throughout the lifespan. So, you know, I think a lot of the time we focus on uh, treatment. So, you know, treatment of disease once it exists or treatment of risk factors once they exist. However, um, in order to improve uh, health and well-being long-term and reduce disease risk, we really need to start early. So we need to start thinking about diet quality in infancy all the way through the life stages um, and not see this as uh, a reaction to a diagnosis, but uh, more as kind of a sustainable way uh, to live. And just to put some, some data around this, so. Um, this is data from the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2 and the uh, Health Professionals Follow-Up Study, which really shows that higher diet quality, regardless of how you measure diet quality, is associated with low risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so we see here they measure diet quality using four different indices. Um, so the first of which is the Healthy Eating Index uh, from 2015. This assesses alignment with the dietary guidelines. So a higher score indicates uh, better alignment with the dietary guidelines. The AMED score is uh, assessing adherence to uh, a Mediterranean diet. And then the Health Professional, uh, sorry, the Healthy Plant-Based Diet Index is assessing um, adherence to a healthy plant-based diet. And then the alternate healthy eating index is assessing uh, another version of adherence to the dietary guidelines. And we see regardless of which index you use to measure diet quality, we see uh, risk reduction in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease. So as we increase adherence or increase diet quality, we see a reduction uh, in CVD uh, risk. However, in saying that, um, you know, I think it's also important to determine, uh, to recognize that a lot goes into the dietary patterns that individuals follow. Um, and we'll talk more about this when we get to the, uh, the translation into clinical practice, but being aware that not everybody gets to choose the foods that they eat. So social determinants do shape um, the foods that we eat. And also our health outcomes are shaped by a lot of individual factors too. So um, diet is not the solution to all of our problems. Um, however, um, it can uh, be a part of the, the solution. So I wanna talk through a little bit what the recommended dietary patterns are in the dietary guidelines. So there's four overarching recommendations. The first being to follow a healthy dietary pattern at every life stage. Um, the second being to customize and enjoy nutrient-dense foods and beverages to reflect personal preferences, cultural traditions, and budgetary considerations. And I think this is critical because, you know, often uh, people are looking for a kind of the one diet um, that is going to solve all of their problems. But there is no one best diet. And as we go through this presentation, you're going to see that healthy dietary patterns, if anything, are more just principles. So um, you can follow any diet, um, and the goal is to, uh, to meet the principles of a healthy dietary pattern. And so the good thing about these um, healthy dietary pattern-based uh, approaches is that they are flexible, and they can be customized to the, the preferences and context of, of individuals. And again, that plays into the long-term sustainability um, and maximizing adherence across the lifespan. Um, point three is focused on meeting food group needs with nutrient-dense foods and staying within caloric limits. Um, so here, uh, kind of recognizing the importance of uh, energy balance for uh, prevention of overweight and obesity. And then item four is related to limiting foods and beverages, high in added sugar, saturated fat, sodium, and uh, alcoholic beverages. In terms of how this is operationalized, so in the dietary guidelines, they do include three examples of healthy eating patterns. Um, and so again, this is in recognition that there is multiple ways to eat a healthy diet. So we have the healthy US style eating pattern, the healthy Mediterranean style eating pattern, and then a healthy vegetarian eating pattern. Um, this is a lacto ovo a vegetarian pattern, but it can be adapted um, to uh, be vegan or uh, remove uh, more of the animal products. So the amounts that I'm showing here are for the 2000 kilocalorie level. In the document, you will see all the other calorie levels too. 
Um, but the key point here is the recommendations are issued in terms of the, the food groups. Um, and you see the units here. Um, the dietary guidelines uses cup equivalents and ounce equivalents. Um, you can think of these like servings. Um, and so what we see here is um, uh, consistency really across the three dietary patterns for recommendations for vegetables, uh, for fruits, and for grains. Um, where we start to see differences is around the protein foods. So the Mediterranean diet tends to be a bit lower in dairy products. Um, and then in terms of the overall uh, breakdown of protein foods, the healthy U.S. style diet um, includes uh, mostly meats, poultry and eggs with some seafood and some nuts. The Mediterranean diet includes uh, more seafood. Um, so you see that here. And then for the vegetarian pattern, um, there are some eggs included here, soy and nut products. Um, and then you see at the top here beans, peas and lentils. So predominantly the protein is, is, plant, is plant protein. Um, we see recommendations here for oil. And then the last category is limit on calories for, for other uses. Um, so really kind of a, a broad framework for what constitutes a healthy diet. But within each of these categories, you can pick foods um, that you enjoy and customize this to your preference and your context. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about those calories for, for other uses. So um, when the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee did their modeling to come up with these healthy dietary patterns, uh, what they found was that 85% of your daily calorie allowance is needed to meet food group recommendations. So to meet those recommendations for fruits, vegetables, grains, dairy, and protein. So this only leaves 15% of calories for uh, non-core foods or, or other foods that don't fit within uh, these food groups. Um, and I think this is an important reminder about um, the, the need to really um, focus on consuming the core foods first and then using remaining calories for those other foods. So um, the data I showed you at the beginning of the presentation around dietary risks showed us that it's um, really the foods that we're not eating that are accounting for the largest proportion of risk. And so when we look at a figure like this, I think we see how that plan plays out because if people are filling up on extra foods, then they don't have enough calories or they're too full to eat all of their core foods. So we need to focus on uh, meeting core food group needs first. And then if you have any calories uh, or you're still hungry, then you can make allowances for some of these other uh, foods. Okay, so I want to switch uh, to briefly talk about the 2021 Dietary Guidance to Improve Cardiovascular Health, because this is a very recent uh, document and they provide a very nice framework for uh, what is a healthy dietary pattern, um, which is even more flexible than the dietary guidelines. But we see a lot of the same principles play out here. Um, and I think the key point here is that there are multiple ways to follow a healthy dietary pattern. And so basically, whenever you're thinking about following a diet or assessing the diet that you're currently following, the goal is to adhere to as many of these principles as possible. Um, and so you see guideline one is around energy intake. Um, so to achieve and maintain a healthy body weight for items two and three, the focus is on fruits and vegetables and then choosing whole grains. For item four, the focus is really around uh, plant protein. So choosing mostly plant protein, um, but including fish and seafood and low fat and fat free dairy products. And if choosing meat or poultry, they need to be lean cuts and non processed forms. Um, Choosing liquid plant oils instead of tropical oils. So these are things like palm oil and coconut oil. And then also uh, limiting animal fats and partially hydrogenated fats. Um, item six is around the processing level of food. So there's a lot of data coming out around um, the negative association of ultra processed foods with health outcomes. Um, so item six is around choosing minimally processed foods. Um, and then item seven and eight are around minimizing added sugars and salt. And then nine is around alcohol. If choosing to drink, intake should be limited. And then item 10 is around adhering to this guidance wherever food is prepared or uh, consumed. Again, getting at the point of habitual consumption. Um, so following a diet 
for one day is not going to influence our long-term health outcomes. Um, so this can really be distilled into, um, you know, the key point that we need to be habitually consuming nutrient-dense forms of foods um, and minimizing energy-dense nutrient-poor foods. But obviously, this is a balancing act. So we need to focus on these healthy foods, but that doesn't mean that we can't have these other foods. We just need to uh, be uh, thinking about the proportion of our calories that are coming from these other foods. Um, and then finally, to talk about the prevention guidelines, you know, we see a lot of consistency here. So we see at the top, a diet should emphasize vegetables, fruits, legumes, nuts, and whole grains. We should replace saturated fat with dietary mono and polyunsaturated fats. We should reduce cholesterol and sodium, minimize intake of processed meats, refined carbohydrates, and sweetened beverages, um, and then uh, limit uh, trans fats. So you know, I think kind of the takeaway from this is I've thrown, shown you three sets uh, of uh, dietary recommendations applicable to cardiovascular disease, and there is broad consistency among these recommendations. So I think often, um, you know, in the in the popular media or the public domain, there is a lot of discussion about how nutrition scientists can't agree on their messaging and we keep changing our minds. Um, however, when you actually look at the recommendation, there is a lot of consistency here. And while there are some um, areas of debate, I think the overarching recommendations are very consistent and really focus on this message around healthy dietary patterns. Um, so now I want to kind of switch to how we can use these evidence-based guidelines in our practice, mostly with a focus um, on um, patient or uh, community-centered um, practice. So the first kind of take home point here is that we need to recognize that dietary intake is a complex behavior and it's really influenced by, by many, uh, many factors. And we need to understand all of the different influences on dietary uh, intake in order to be able to um, successfully treat patients or work with uh, community groups. I think sometimes we wanna simplify the message um, however, the unintended consequence of that is that sometimes patients can feel like they're not being listened to or they can feel like there's something wrong with them because they're not able to do this simple thing that everybody else is able to do. So we really need to understand all of the different things that go into uh, what people consume in order to be able to effectively manage their dietary risks. I think a second part of this is thinking about uh, what is uh, what is the uh, current intake in the US population. So often when we're working with patients or uh, population groups, we may not have good ways to diet quality, or if we can, um, we don't necessarily know what kinds of questions to ask. Um, so I think having some awareness of what intake levels are in the US population uh, baseline and then we can determine um, the, the actual dietary risk in the population that we're working with. So this is data from the dietary guidelines using NHANES data. And uh, what, they're, what they're showing here is the healthy eating index score, uh, which is a score out of 100 with a higher score indicating greater diet quality. And what we see is across all age groups in the US population, diet quality is poor. Um, so the highest diet quality we see is in the 60 plus age group of 63, but this is still well above what we would consider ideal, which would be closer to 80. Um, so you can kind of think of this as like a percentage adherence to the dietary guidelines. So, you know, most population groups are really around kind of a failing grade. And we see this really hasn't uh, changed over time. Um, we also see that intake of saturated fat, added sugars, and sodium are very high. Um, this is data from the 31 to uh, 59 age group, but across all the different age groups, we see the same pattern of consumption. So we're really over-consuming those extra calories. I think another important piece of information here is what is the public perception of diet or what is the public uh, doing? What diets are they following? What do they cite as key motivators for diet uh, choices? So this is data from the International Food Information Council, and this is their most recent survey, the 2022 survey. And so what they do is they ask a representative sample of the U.S. population. So it's weighted for uh, U.S. population demographic uh, characteristics. Um, 
a series of questions. And I think there's some important insights here, which we can use when we're thinking about how to change diet for patients or within the community. Um, so in the most recent survey, 52% of US adults reported following a diet. And you can see this is a, a market jump from the, the year prior. So now we have half, over half of the population saying they're following a diet. And when we uh, probe further as to what they're eating, we see the number one diet or eating pattern they're following is clean eating followed by mindful eating. Um, important to point out here that these are, uh, it's a multiple choice answer. So they can select any of these different uh, categories. Um, and what we see here is a lot of fad diets being followed, diets that um, don't have a whole lot of evidence behind them or maybe are being pushed by a commercial interest, something of, of that nature. So for something like clean eating, there's not really a definition of what clean eating is. However, the uh, generally within the public, people cite this when they say they're, they're trying to eat better or trying to eat foods that maybe have uh, shorter ingredient lists, so that kind of thing. Um, in terms of some of the, the dietary patterns that are maybe recommended, we do see plant-based listed here. Uh, we do see things like a Mediterranean style diet, a DASH diet, vegetarian and vegan diet. So we see some of those represented, but we do see a lot of diets that we wouldn't necessarily recommend listed here. Um, when we look at demographic characteristics, we do see the jump in dieting uh, has been mostly in the under 50 age group. However, I think something important to point out here is also the breakdown um, by gender. So historically, dieting has been something associated with females or women. Um, however, we see for the most recent survey that it's almost equal males and uh, females. In terms of motivations, you know, I think this is interesting to think about why people want to change their diet or why they're following a diet. Um, a key motivation is around health. Um, and wanting to protect long-term health or lose weight, uh, maybe to feel better or have more energy, improve uh, appearance. Um, we do see some things coming in now around uh, the environment, for example, um, or wanting to uh, follow dietary guidelines or maybe having a recommendation from a healthcare provider. Um, and we do still see here um, things like reading about diets or nutrition information online or in other places. However, I think it's also important to recognize that only one in five people say that they seek health benefits from food. So most of our nutrition messaging is around health benefits, but not everybody is motivated by health benefits. So we do need to be aware that there are other reasons for following a diet other than um, for, for health related reasons. Um, and so a key uh, what we do know about key drivers of uh, food choice and purchase decisions are that taste is the leading factor. Um, and this becomes important because there's often a perception around healthy foods that they don't taste good um, and you need to uh, deprive yourself of things that you enjoy to follow a healthy diet. So I think we need to kind of reconcile these two things. And in order to get people to follow healthy diets, we also need to improve the taste profile and enjoyment of these diets. Um, price is also a key factor, as well as healthfulness and convenience. Um, and we see environmental sustainability there as well. Um, this was probably the most striking piece of data that was in this survey for this current year. Uh, which was uh, that people reported that well, there has been a, an increase in the number of people that purport, reported they would rather take a medication for a health condition than change their lifestyle. So historically, um, the majority of people have said that they would prefer to change their lifestyle than take medication. But now we see close to 50% in the 18 to 34 age group that say that they would prefer to take a medication than change their lifestyle. So I think this gives us some hint into um, maybe the difficulty around changing lifestyle and the fact um, that people see this as a challenging issue and therefore would prefer to, to take a medication. Um, and so I think, you know, when we are trying to uh, treat health behaviors with lifestyle related uh, change, we do need to be aware of all the different factors that play into uh, behavior change and whether or not an individual can change their diet or any other uh, lifestyle behavior. Um, so this is the most recent uh, Life's Essential 8 from the American Heart Association, eight aspects that 
cardiovascular health. Um, so we see at the top the health behaviors and then at the bottom the risk factors. So the health behaviors are um, avoid tobacco exposure, uh, sleep, diet, and then also physical activity. And then for the risk factors, we see um, controlling blood glucose level, body weight, blood lipids, and then also blood pressure. And so in this uh, figure eight here, they've kind of nicely distilled the complex interplay of these dietary behaviors and risk factors with the social determinants of health, but also with psychological health. And so um, whether or not an individual is able to change their uh, their behaviors is going to be uh, somewhat dependent on their psychological health and then also social determinants uh, of health. And so I think that really uh, distilled the importance of taking a patient-centered approach to ASCVD risk prevention or cardiovascular disease prevention to really uh, try to meet the patient where they are and to help them with the particular barriers uh, that they may have. So from the 2019 AHA ACC guidelines, we do see a level 1A recommendation for a team-based approach to the control of risk factors. Um, we see a recommendation around shared decision-making and then also um, using social determinants of health to inform optimal implementation of treatment recommendations. Um, and I think this is critical when we're dealing with lifestyle-related uh, risk factors or dietary risk factors because there are so many uh, determinants here. Um, so I think when we're, when we're treating patients in this manner, we really need to be mindful of trying to meet a person where they are and not making assumptions um, about where they are or what their health goals are. We also need to be mindful of the language that we use um, with patients. So you know, often we're using uh, risk related language. So, you know, you have this risk factor, therefore you are at risk of this disease. However, we really need to be framing this in a more positive way to uh, help them see their opportunity to improve their health um, and also recognize what their motivations are for making that change. We also need to recognize the importance of incremental and small changes. So, you know, we don't need to uh, radically overhaul somebody's uh, lifestyle in the first appointment. You know, we can have small changes that then over time lead up and support sustained uh, behavioral change. And then using referrals. So using our team to help people um, with maybe the particular issues or barriers they may have to lifestyle related uh, change. However, in saying that, it's well established that there are a lot of barriers to assessing diet or other behavior change in clinical settings. So things like we need to focus on more medically urgent issues, um, clinicians feel like they're inadequately trained um, and um, have limited confidence in delivering this kind of care or um, health insurance companies may not reimburse. Um, there is low perceived demand for patient diet related counseling, lack of supportive resources, time constraint, and then um, some clinicians perceive uh, diet related behavior change as lacking in, in efficacy. So the 5A model um, is identified by the US uh, Preventative Services Task Force as a unifying framework for behavioral counseling in primary care. And um, the great thing about this framework is it's designed with attention to the demands of clinical settings and overcoming some of those things that I spoke about in the previous slide. So they're designed to be brief and focused intervention strategies to guide the process of counseling. Um, it really requires minimal training of clinicians, minimal changes to workload and workflow, and can be built on and reinforced across, um, across time. So here's an overview of how the five A's could look for diet-related behavior change counseling in uh, clinical settings. Um, and so um, we start with assess. So here we will assess the patient's diet, maybe their knowledge about the link between diet and CBD risk, and then their intention to make uh, dietary changes. Um, so this is important to understand where they are so we can meet them there. Um, in the second A, we advise the patient on their specific dietary risks and benefits of dietary change in a non-judgmental, non-confrontational way. Um, in, the, in the third A, we then agree 
on a SMART goal for diet-related behaviour change. And then in the fourth A, we then assist the patient to anticipate barriers to diet-related um, goals and develop a plan to facilitate uh, behaviour change. And then in the final A, this is where we arrange a plan to follow up on progress and provide referrals to access patient resources um, based on their uh, preferences. Um, so when we're assessing the diet, it is important to um, you know, do this in a way that the patient doesn't feel uh, judged. So the ORS approach is helpful in the sense it provides a framework to ask open-ended questions to then affirm what the patient says so they feel listened to, reflect what they're saying, and then to summarize. And this helps the clinician to get a sense of um, what they're uh, where they currently are and where they want to go. And so everybody's kind of on the same uh, page. So this slide kind of goes through how this how this may look. In the second A, we then use the ask, tell, ask approach. So this is where we ask the patient for permission to offer more information. Again, this helps the patient to feel comfortable um, and to feel like they're giving um, their permission um, to have this conversation. Here we want to give clear, specific, personalized advice to address gaps in knowledge and understanding, and then also ask questions to determine what action the patient wishes to take. So remembering the patient is the center uh, of this. Um, in terms of agree, here's where we want to use shared decision making. So we want to discuss with the patient and agree on a diet-related goal that is, is smart, um, but also it should improve intake and be feasible and appropriate for the patient to implement. And in recognition that um, usually one change at a time may not be So sometimes we need to prioritize um, and make one change at a time or two complementary uh, changes. And then for the assist part, this is where the clinician should uh, assist the patient to anticipate barriers to achieving the agreed goal and develop a specific plan. So it's not necessarily that the, the clinician needs to um, solve all the problems for the patient, just needs to guide the patient through thinking through this behavior change, some potential barriers and what are gonna be appropriate solutions for them. So here we may uh, uh, get them to identify some personal barriers, uh, get them to try and brainstorm the solutions, analyze the pros and cons of the solutions, choose a desired solution, and then develop an action plan. And then finally, for a range, we need to recognize that diet-related behavior change is an ongoing iterative process. So we need ongoing follow-up to produce meaningful behavior change. And so we should come up with a plan for next steps and how progress is going to be measured. And if referrals are needed or uh, possible, then uh, these should be uh, provided. And so finally, we finish up with the tell back, uh, teach back approach to ensure there's a common understanding um, of uh, what is uh, what are the goals and what are the next uh, steps. Um, however, I think it is also important to recognize that, um, you know, during routine clinic visits, this is where the behavior change process can be initiated. And uh, it's an important time to motivate patients to consider behavior change. Um, but for long term sustained behavior change, we're going to need more intensive uh, support. So thinking about, you know, what those support systems are and how to help patients make these, these complex changes. So there was a really nice paper published um, in 2021, which really goes through um, these behavior change programs and provides uh, options for referring patients to these kinds of programs or setting up these programs in uh, practices you uh, may be working in. Um, and so the, the key resources um, are here and I will share my slides afterwards so, so you have uh, all of these. Um, so in summary, I hope what you're taking away from this is that uh, we use science to inform our evidence-based uh, guidelines, and our evidence-based guidelines form the foundation of our uh, practice, but really our patients are at the center of this. So we need to tailor our practice to meet uh, the needs of patients and to meet them where they are, recognizing that patients have, um, you know, maybe many uh, competing uh, interests, uh, and complexities, um, which may be uh, barriers to them achieving behavior change. So we need to recognize these things 
and help them uh, through that process to make long-term sustained uh, behavior change. Um, and with that, I'll finish and I'm happy to take questions or you know, please reach out if you if you have questions. Thank you. And I might stop my share screen. Yeah. See you all. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. I'm sure we'll have some questions from this group. So I'll go ahead and open up if anyone wants to unmute and ask their question. Actually, Pam, I see you're unmuted. Or you can put them in the chat. Well, I, I have a question. Um, when you're talking to a patient and let's say you're you're showing them the equivalencies, the cup equivalencies in the DGAs, how do you get them to understand what that means? I feel like that's a question I get a lot. What is a serving size? What does that look like? How do I know how much I'm eating? Yeah, so it's a it's a good question um, and a couple points. So the first point is um, for the dietary guidelines document that I showed today, um, the target audience of that is is healthcare professionals, right, or clinicians. So um, patients shouldn't necessarily um, be seeing that document and all the language around cup equivalents and things like that. Um, however, we still need to communicate servings uh, to patients. So um, the, the public outreach component of the dietary guidelines is uh, MyPlate. Um, and so MyPlate has a lot of resources where they um, talk about serving sizes, but in common um, language, you know, like a medium piece of fruit is a, is a serving of fruit, right? So people can say, okay, from a food item that you're going to eat, how does that translate to a serving? Um, another really great thing about MyPlate now is they do have an app um, that you can download to your phone. So there's a lot of information in there for patients that they can access in real time. And that also has some you know, behavior change functions built into it so they can set goals. Um, there's a quiz that you do when you first download it um, where it asks you about your current diet with a few simple questions. And then from that, you can set a goal and then monitor progress and things like that. So that's a good thing to to use with patients too. And high tech. We have a question from Lynn Cutler, which I think is a great one because I hear this a lot too. Any thoughts on the fact that clients or patients want to take meds instead of changing eating behavior? Yeah, and I think, you know, that's something that we deal with, but I think, you know, all of our recommendations tell us that you know, diet is first line intervention for uh, any lifestyle related condition, right? And so what that means is it's not one or the other, right? It's both. So if they want to take medication, you know, they should they should do that. And, and that can be their path for now. But we can start that contemplation of maybe, you know, diet um, is something that some point. So we sort of start the conversation. Um, and then every time we see them, we kind of revisit the issue and say, okay, you know, have you had time to think about, you know, what we talked about last time? Um, you know, do you want to have a conversation about diet today? And we just kind of take it at their pace, right? Because maybe today they're not ready for that. But maybe at some point in the future, especially if they do start taking medications, and maybe their symptoms improve, or they start to feel better, it may be something that they can take on at a later. Um, right, absolutely. It's all about the stages of change and meeting them where they are. I, I love that. That's you're preaching to the choir on this one. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other questions? I and mean, it was a very well thought out talk. I feel like you kind of preventatively answered the questions, which I really appreciate. Oh, Lynn, Lynn's into the stages of change too. Wonderful. Love that. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, what if uh, as we age, our uh, absorption of all these nutrients is going down? So what is your thought of taking supplement? Yeah, so that can certainly, um, you know, be an issue. However, I do think, um, you know, you should be talking to your primary care provider um, before taking any supplements. Um, you know, in some cases, they can check your status. So, you know, something like vitamin D, um, you know, they can check your status and advise you about whether or not you need to be taking a supplement. Um, I think it is important to just 
briefly mention, you know, some supplements have risk, right? And people think that taking nutrition, nutritional supplements is safe. Um, however, when you're taking very high doses of nutrients or other kind of bioactives, there can be risks associated with that. And then when you're taking a whole cocktail of them, there can be interactions, right? So it's always good to mention that to your healthcare provider and just see what, what they would recommend. Um, because um, the dietary guidelines do deal with uh, recommendations for what they term older adults, so the 60 plus age group. Um, mm -hmm. And the recommendations are not broadly different from younger adults. So the table I put up was um, for, uh, you know, adults, so 19 to, to 59. Um, but the in terms of the food group recommendations, they're very similar. So in theory, you can meet your nutrient needs with diet. Um, however, it does warrant a discussion with your primary care provider. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, we are out of time, so I think we're going to stop there. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, Christina, and thank you, all of you for joining us for this talk. Um, it has been recorded, so if you think someone else should have seen this, and you can go to our website and send them the recording. And I will share my slides. I see that's in the chat right now. So yes, <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> Thanks. They will be very useful. <laughs> all right. Take care. Bye, everyone.